Now, as you may be aware, the BBC's current affairs programme, Question Time, is coming this evening from West Bromwich, from Sandwell College. An online campaign has been growing since someone wrote a letter to the programme asking for David Icke to be included on the panel. He won't be on the panel, but he joins us now. David, very good morning to you. Hello, mate, all right? I'm very good, yeah. And David, when uh, when the... I think somebody who just kind of supports your general worldview wrote to uh, to Question Time, there was a, a fairly dismissive response, it's fair to say, from a Newsnight producer. Well, from a Question Time producer, Sorry, yeah. Sorry, a Newsnight Question Time producer, yeah. What did they say? Oh, uh, something about uh, my masters from the planet Zog say no or something. <laughs> but let, just let me uh, make this, uh, which was... Um, really credible from a, a, a program that, uh, you know, claims to be a credible and professional itself. But let me just say this. If I was asked on question time, uh, I would go on because another version of the world needs to be put forward, especially at this time when what was in my books uh, 15, 16 years ago is now being reported on the television news as changes in society. But I don't really care if I go on question time or not because it's an irrelevant program as it's currently constituted because all it does is overwhelmingly have politicians from apparently different parties it says here someone told me once um, that use mere words to try to make uh, the case that they're different when in terms of policy they're all on the same postage stamp which is why when uh, conservative replace labor nothing changes the same deal goes on, and when uh, Mr. Change Obama, I'm different, I'm change, I, I, I'm, I'm genuine, I'm, I'm not like the others, replaces George Bush, um, he is George Bush on steroids. So we have to realize that we live in a one-party state, um, as Americans do and many people around the world do, because we are not actually given political choice. We're given different colors and different names but when they get into government, they all do the same. Now, the next question is, why do they do the same? And what's the force that's in the background that's orchestrating the same through whichever party is um, officially in power? Yeah, so uh, let me just stop you there, David. Then you're suggesting that, that this is not just a chance that effectively the political parties are all of the same hue behind the, the colours that they wear at election time. You think there is a, a, an orchestration behind all this? Yes, Adrian. I mean, uh, you know, I've not sat in a darkened room um, breathing in some uh, uh, smoke and coming to these conclusions. I've been uh, investigating this now full-time for nearly a quarter of a century. I've written 16 books, uh, uh, well, nearly 20 books actually now on it. I've been to more than 50 countries um, uh, researching it. Uh, it was a lonely road to start with 22, 23 years ago, but now thousands of people all over the world are doing the same research and coming up with uh, the same basic conclusions in terms of the fact that there is n not just a national, there is a global network of families and secret societies that are behind this incessant centralization of power in all areas of our lives. And so, so, that's very important. Just let me finish yeah, the yeah, point. Yeah. If there's a few of you, and in this group compared with 7 billion people, there is a few, then to gain more and more power over the many, you have to incessantly centralize decision-making. And this process that I've been exposing all these years and continue to do in greater detail uh, was given a name a long time ago, although people didn't realize what they were saying. It's called globalization. What is that? The centralization of power in all areas of our lives. We're having the centralization of power militarily in terms of banking. I I in all these areas, uh, the European Union is a classic centralization of power uh, in the hands of a few unelected bureaucrats in Brussels dictating to the whole of Europe. And this is a long-term, uh, long-planned scenario that's going on in terms of this centralization of power in Europe. And David, David, let me just interrupt you there, because... I do want to ask questions of you. I'm interested to hear what you have to say. Um, the people who are behind this orchestration, uh, what unites them? Are they united by religion? Are they united by blood? I don't want you to name names because that would get us into areas of potential libel, but, but what unites this group of people and how are they managing to keep their orchestration of the world secret from most of the rest of us? Well, uh, 
a number of uh, answers to that. First of all, I've been naming names in my books, and when I speak at Wembley all day, Wembley Arena you've in October. Yeah, you've in got October. a big, big conference at Wembley Arena. Yeah, I mean, you, yeah? that's another thing, Adrian, quickly before I answer those questions. Yeah, yeah. Um, people need to ask themselves that why are thousands and thousands and thousands of people coming to hear what I have to say all over the world, including the Wembley Arena in on October the 27th, when I'm putting this together over nine hours, connecting all the dots, because there's so many dots to connect. It's because they've added the, the uh, self-respect to actually look at what I'm saying in detail and make their own minds upon it. But in terms of, uh, of the questions, first of all, in my books and at Wembley, I'm going to be, uh, and I do, name or uh, a number of these names and I'm still waiting for a libel and I've been doing it now for nearly 25 uh, uh, years. Yeah. But um, in terms of the connection, it's blood, it's bloodline. You know, the, the so-called blue bloods where the royals uh, systematically uh, interbred with each other or interbreed with each other, that only uh, not only happens with the overt royal bloodlines, but those that wear dark suits and control the banking system, the transnational corporations, government, and particularly that which manipulates uh, uh, through government. And, you know, in terms of the European Union, uh, Jean Monnet, the so-called founding father of what's become the European Union, he wrote a letter to a friend 60 years ago, the day after my birthday, actually, April the 30th, 1952. And he said this, Europe's nations should be guided towards the superstate without their people understanding what is happening. This can be accomplished by successive steps, each disguised as having an economic purpose, but which will eventually and irreversibly lead to federation. It's been the game all along, and they're still doing it. All this stuff, uh, Adrian, with Greece and Italy and Spain and Portugal is creating the, the chaos th out of which they can offer their solution to the chaos, which is to advance this agenda of incessant centralization of power. And David, I, I know you, you're going to answer the second point of the question I asked before. Let me just ask you this, though. Yeah, because the, the question, Adrian, uh, of, of how they do it is important, and I can, yeah, add, no, add, no, I can before, answer that. Before you do, let me just ask you, though, because you've, you've talked about this bloodline then. Yeah. Just to clarify, then, if I, Adrian Goldberg, or you, David Icke, wanted to be part of this clan, is, is there any way that we, we could sort of break through and be, be, be a member of it, be admitted to this inner circle? Uh, not if you're not of their, their bloodline, mm. um, but uh, they use endless agents and gophers from the top, uh, which they uh, recruit from the target population. And what's in it for the gophers then? Presumably these are kind of pliant politicians oh, who will are, do their bidding. Well, well wealth and power, and it's mm. sometimes uh, sheer terror at not doing what they're told. To answer the question about how, how they do it, th th there is a global structure um, by which the center can dictate to the whole planet. And it works like this. Uh, it's the same structure, basically, as a transnational corporation, except that it's bloodline families and secret societies. So if you take a corporation like McDonald's, it has a headquarters in America. But that headquarters dictates to all the McDonald's all over the world in terms of policy, corporate image, and all the rest of it. So if you go into a McDonald's in Johannesburg, Sydney, uh, uh, Moscow, anywhere, you'll go into basically the same McDonald's. Yes, and we're just talking about any global corporation. You're just happening to mention McDonald's as an example. As an example, yeah. yeah. But uh, and the, the example I use McDonald's for is because it's so blatantly the same corporate image wherever you go. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, in terms of this uh, network, it works exactly the same way, but with bloodline families and, um, and with uh, secret societies. So... In Europe, not America, funny enough, although there is much of it in America, obviously, but in, in, in Europe is in places like the city of London, Rome, Paris, Berlin, Brussels. It's the center of, of the web, if you like, the spider. It's like the McDonald's headquarters in America. And it dictates to its subsidiaries, which are bloodline families and secret society networks in each country. And the job of those networks in, each, in, in their sphere of influence, their country, is to impose the uh, policy dictated from the center, uh, financially, politically, in terms of media ownership, uh, business, uh, banking, uh, all, the, all the rest of it. And they themselves have subsidiaries within the country down into towns, cities, communities, uh, regions. And through this network, what is dictated centrally, globally, goes through into uh, uh, virtually every country. And this is, uh, you know, uh, uh, on the road to what they want, 
which I've been pointing this out now for 20 years, they want a world government which would dictate to every nation. They want a world central bank that would control all global finance. They want a world single currency which would not be cash, it would merely be electronic, for which there are a massive implications for freedom. And they want a world army imposing the will of the world government. And we've reached the point now, Adrian, where we have de facto versions, basically, of those things. We have a de facto world government, which uh, acts under code names like the G8 and the UN Security Council, and we have a de facto world uh, army called NATO, and when the G8 or the UN Security Council, this, this tiny cabal, say, uh, this, this country, this regime's not playing ball, they send the world army in, NATO, to... to, to pepper bomb civilians from the air on the pretext of protecting civilians from violence and and so what they want eventually is an official version of that where the world army uh, um, goes in when the world government dictates it and you know george orwell with his 1984 and uh, older suxley with his brave new world uh, the latter was published in 1932 the the former in 1948, they weren't coming from a perspective of their imagination only. They were both members and had access to something called the Fabian Society. And through that secret society is at its core, which was responsible and still is for the uh, London School of Economics, they access what the projected agenda was. And that's why they've been so amazingly accurate in the light of current events. Well, listen, David, uh, it's been fascinating to listen to you. I know that uh, you have written some harsh things about the BBC. Uh, our view, certainly on this programme, on BBC WM, is that uh, people have points of view, uh, and our job is to hear them and, and to chew them over. Uh, you've had, I think, nearly 15 minutes on this show, so no attempt at censorship, no attempt to shut you up. Um, can, I, can I ask you this question? At a future date, would you be willing, uh, and fairly soon, uh, to come on air, maybe spend an hour with us and take calls from our listeners uh, yeah, that about would, your that, beliefs? Yeah, that, 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 would, that would be good. Is, and, that a, is that a deal? Yeah, and let me say this, Adrian. You know, when I'm uh, challenging the BBC, I'm not challenging everyone who works for the BBC. I'm challenging that that at the centre, the top, which dictates uh, policy. Of course you can get on uh, places like, uh, you know, Radio WM now and again, but these key areas uh, uh, of, of national television, you, you can't get on. And, and the dismissal from, from uh, those people, and they've apologised since, which I've accepted, just shows the, the arrogance, and not only that, the absolute focus on the fact that if you're not in politics, you don't matter, or if you're not in some way connected to the political system, you don't matter in terms of your voice. Well, there's 60-odd million people in this country, and we all uh, have a voice and different views, and that program should reflect them. David, really appreciate your time this morning. Thank you so much for coming on. As I say, we will honour our commitment. If you will honour it as your, on your side, as I'm sure you will, uh, we'll take calls from listeners interacting with you for an hour on BBC WM. Many thanks indeed to uh, David Icke. I should uh, point out, we refer to the slightly dismissive or funny response from Newsnight, uh, sorry, from Question Time, when uh, one of David's supporters approached them and invited David to appear. Uh, an apology was made following that contact via email. Uh, thank you for contacting uh, the BBC uh, about our response to a suggestion that David Icke should appear as a guest on the question. They now acknowledge that the tone of their emailed response from a member of the programme's production team was inappropriate and they do apologise. And as you heard from David himself, uh, that apology has now been accepted. If you're going to question time in West Brom tonight... Uh, will you miss David Icke? Uh, should people like David and David himself be given a broader platform to speak? Are they telling truths which are too uncomfortable to hear? Or are they simply beyond the realms of credibility? 08453 00 You're listening to Adrian Goldberg. The time now is 21 minutes past 11.